good morning, everybody. Uh, it's good to see a, a good uh, crowd here, and I'd like to thank the organizers for uh, inviting me uh, to this uh, beautiful city. And uh, it's also a welcome change from Minnesota. We had a terrible winter. Uh, we had a time where it was minus 31 Fahrenheit. Uh, that's pretty cold. Uh, so I'm glad to be here. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to talk about biologic therapy in IBD. Um, here are my uh, disclosures. Uh, we're going to talk first about ulcerative colitis, and then we'll talk about Crohn's disease. So our treatment goals in ulcerative colitis include making the diagnosis, assessing the patient's prognosis, achieving bowel function that's normal, improving quality of life, inducing remission rapidly if possible, maintaining steroid-free remission over time, uh, hopefully with mucosal healing, and then ultimately the goal is with all of these things to modify the long-term outcome of the condition uh, by decreasing hospitalization and surgery, uh, eliminating disability, minimizing exposure to corticosteroids. So how do we do this? Uh, you're all familiar with these medications. We're not going to talk about 5-ASA and corticosteroids right now. And uh, Dr. Yamamoto just uh, reviewed the evidence for immunomodulators. And you know, in the, in the United States, we don't talk that as much about immunomodulators uh, anymore, but I think in places where access to biologics is potentially limited for a variety of reasons, I think immunomodulators remain a cornerstone of uh, therapy. So in ulcerative colitis, the biologics that we have available are infliximab, adalimumab, golimumab, and vetolizumab. Um, tofacitinib is, I guess, a new medication, technically not a biologic. I'm going to speak about tofacitinib uh, tomorrow in the talk about new and emerging therapy. So we'll, we won't talk about tofacitinib today. Um, so when we assess the patient, we want to look at their disease activity, but that alone isn't enough to determine if the patient is a low-risk patient or a high-risk patient. We've all seen patients that have extensive colitis but have very mild colitis, and we also see patients with proctitis that can be severe. So we have to look at other factors to determine the patient's prognosis, and this could include the presence of deeper ulcers on endoscopy, uh, younger age at diagnosis, um, high CRP, high sedimentation rate, patients who require steroids in multiple natural history studies, the patient who requires steroids are more likely to go on to require surgery. Likewise, patients who early on in their course have been hospitalized are more likely to require surgery. And then the presence of co-infection like Clostridium difficile or cytomegalovirus might herald a, a worse prognosis. And so we, we have to break down our patients into the low risk and high risk outpatients and then also the uh, high risk inpatients. So let's talk about the high risk outpatients first. Um, we have a variety of uh, ways to induce therapy including corticosteroids and immunomodulators. We've just heard about that. But we've got the anti-TNF, ideally in combination with an immunomodulator, uh, vetolizumab plus or minus uh, an immunomodulator. And um, if you choose one of these biologics, then for maintenance, you're, you're obviously going to want to continue that biologic if the patient um, has responded. So let's talk a little bit about these. So the anti-TNFs. We have three anti-TNFs approved for ulcerative colitis. And so the top row shows you the eight-week data, and the second row shows you the one-year data. And you can see that just as an eyeball comparison, and again, we're not supposed to do this because these are different groups of patients, different studies, but you can see by the eyeball comparison that infliximab has the overall highest uh, remission rates as well as the biggest delta. The delta is the difference between the study drug and the placebo. Adalimumab and golimumab um, look a, roughly about the same to one another. 
uh, both with respect to the overall response rate and also the difference uh, between uh, placebo. And we also have vetalizumab. Uh, you're all familiar with the Gemini 1 study. This is looking at the week 6 induction data, and you can see that um, the, the, the results were statistically significant for both response, remission, and mucosal healing. And then the maintenance data were also uh, positive. You can see very big deltas between the study drug and the placebo. The every eight week and the every four week doses were about the same for most of these uh, clinical endpoints. Um, so what about the high risk patients who have not achieved remission? What do we do about those patients? And that's where I think, you know, dose optimization uh, comes into play. So for the patients who haven't responded to corticosteroids, we're going to move them on to either an anti-TNF plus or minus a thiopurine or vetalizumab plus or minus an immunomodulator. If the patient had been on an anti-TNF but either hadn't responded or had lost response, you would want to check a level, therapeutic drug monitoring. If the level is low and there's low antibodies, you could go ahead and increase the dose of that drug. If the level is low and they're high antibodies, you should probably switch to another drug. It could still be within the anti-TNF class. But if the level is therapeutic, the patient has active disease, you might want to consider switching out of class to vetalizumab. For the patient uh, who was on a th uh, steroids and a thiopurine who has lost response, one consideration, as we just heard from Dr. Yamamoto, would be to check a 6-TGN level, and if the level is low, uh, increase the dose of the thiopurine and recheck metabolites. But if the level is high, you might want to consider adding a biologic to that patient's regimen, either an anti-TNF or vetalizumab. If you had started the patient on vetalizumab, then you might want to consider increasing the dose of this to every four weeks. The role of therapeutic drug monitoring with vetalizumab is still a bit unclear. We recently looked at our own experience at Mayo with vetalizumab levels, and although there were correlations with CRP, for example, if the CRP was low, the vetalizumab level tended to be higher. However, when we compared mucosal healing versus no mucosal healing, we couldn't see any statistically significant difference in the levels. So I'm still not clear in my own clinical practice the exact role of therapeutic drug monitoring for uh, vetalizumab. Okay, how about the high-risk inpatients, the patients who have acute severe colitis, who are in the hospital very sick on IV steroids, uh, if you can get them into remission with IV steroids, you could consider any one of a number of options, including a thiopurine, anti-TNF, vetalizumab. If they don't respond to steroids, however, you need to think about either um, surgery, which is always a reasonable option, uh, but other considerations would be infliximab or cyclosporin. For the patient who receives infliximab in the hospital, you could continue the infliximab, or if they fail infliximab, I think you should uh, seriously consider colectomy. And for the patient who you've treated with cyclosporin, you could consider uh, starting them on a thiopurine if they've responded and continuing that, or one of the biologics, or if they're a cyclosporin failure, you probably should consider uh, colectomy. Now, I wanted to spend a couple of minutes uh, talking about the Varsity trial, which was presented last month at ECHO. And this is the first head-to-head -head trial of, a, of two biologics in inflammatory bowel disease. You know, we do all these uh, things like compare across studies, network meta-analysis, real-world effectiveness, but really the bottom line, the highest level of evidence is if we compare two drugs head-to-head. -head. And so this is the first one comparing two biologics. Uh, this was a large trial. There were 771 patients who were randomized to either adalimumab sub-Q with placebo IV infusions or vetalizumab infusions with placebo sub-Q. So it was a double-blind, double-dummy uh, randomization. You can see that uh, there were more patients in the vetalizumab arm 
who completed the trial because there were patients who dropped out due to uh, lack of efficacy. There were a higher number of those in the adalimumab group. And this is the primary endpoint uh, to the left, the overall result, and you can see that there were a higher percentage of patients in clinical remission, 31 percent versus 22 percent in the adalimumab treated group. There was no dose escalation allowed in either arm, so there was no escalating to weekly for adalimumab or to every four weeks for vetalizumab. Everybody had to stay at the fixed dose, and there was no re-randomization at induction. This was a treat straight through trial design. You can see that the results were largely driven by the anti-TNF naive patients, um, and when you looked at the anti-TNF exposed patients, and that was capped in the trial at 25 percent. Only 25 percent of the patients were exposed to anti-TNF. The other 75 percent were anti-TNF naive. But you can see in the anti-TNF exposed, there were numerical differences, but not statistically significant differences. Mucosal healing was another endpoint, and you can see that this was significantly better for vetalizumab at 39.7 percent versus 27.7 percent. And again, the results are largely driven by the anti-TNF naive patients. Um, the, the difference uh, in the anti-TNF exposed was numerical, but not statistically significant. Uh, steroid use was not, um, so only about a third of the patients were on corticosteroids in the trial, and it really wasn't powered to demonstrate uh, steroid-free remission, but you could see that actually there were more patients on adalimumab and steroid-free remission than with vetalizumab. Again, not statistically significant. Um, there was no forced steroid tapering in this trial, so that may explain some of these differences, but that is the one curious thing that doesn't, everything else sort of fits with vetalizumab being better, uh, but this endpoint, we're still trying to figure out what this means. So the conclusion of this trial was that uh, vetalizumab was uh, better at inducing clinical remission and mucosal healing compared to adalimumab in moderate to severe UC at the end of a year. And again, most of this was driven by the anti-TNF naive population. Um, we didn't, I didn't show you the data, but some of the differences appeared to emerge as early as week six and week 14, and uh, both drugs were generally safe and well tolerated. So this would suggest that you'd want to use vetalizumab prior to adalimumab in your patients with ulcerative colitis. Um, so I'm going to uh, skip this in the interest of time. I think for positioning biologics and ulcerative colitis, we need more of these head-to-head -head studies. For the average patient, if you were going to pick between vetalizumab and adalimumab, this result would favor vetalizumab. Where infliximab fits in here, it's still not clear. We don't have head-to-head -head data. I think all of us are always fairly impressed with the results of infliximab, but we don't know exactly where to position this now. I think a patient with extra intestinal manifestations like spondyloarthropathy, arthralgias, uveitis, pyoderma, I would lean towards an anti-TNF. For the acute severe colitis patient in the hospital, we have the most data with infliximab, so I would go there. For an older or immunosuppressed patient where I'm worried about uh, infection risk, I would go with vetalizumab. Patient who has a personal history of cancer, uh, although we have data uh, from retrospective studies in the U.S. that it's probably okay to give an anti-TNF to those patients, I would consider vetalizumab, and you probably are going to be able to convince the patient more easily to go with vetalizumab. And for the risk-averse patient, the patient who focuses more on safety than efficacy, I think vetalizumab is going to be an easier sell. Positioning of tofacitinib, I think, remains unclear. You could easily make an argument to use it both before or after a biologic. In my own practice in the U.S., I've been using it mostly after a biologic, but you could certainly consider it before. So let's talk a little bit about Crohn's disease. Uh, similar to what we described in UC, you're going to assess the patient overall. You're going to look at their comorbidities. You're going to look at their current disease burden by scoping them and CT anterography, and then you're going to try to decide is this patient a high-risk patient or a low-risk patient. And if they're a low-risk patient, you might even consider just treating them with 
budesonide or uh, azathioprine, if they're a higher risk patient, I would argue that you'd want to go to a biologic fairly early on. So when we assess our patients, you know, we're going to be checking symptoms, we're going to be checking uh, blood work like a CBC and a CRP. We may want to get a fecal calprotectin. Uh, for the patient that has colonic disease, a colonoscopy may be sufficient, but recall that 70% of our Crohn's patients have some small bowel disease and therefore some type of cross-sectional imaging may be useful to uh, assess these patients. And then again, you're going to look at the factors and decide, is this patient high risk or low risk? The patient who was diagnosed under the age of 30, that's a higher risk patient. Patients with iliocolonic disease, more extensive disease, they're higher risk. Patients that have perianal or severe rectal disease, higher risk. Deep ulcers, higher risk. Patients that have already had surgery, the stakes are higher. That patient already has had one resection. They're that much closer to maybe getting partial short bowel syndrome. That's a higher risk patient. So you look at all these factors, and when you put everything together, I would argue that probably 70 to 80 percent of our Crohn's patients are high risk patients, and it's only about 20 percent, 30 percent that fit in that mild low risk category. So again, you look at your factors, you determine high risk or low risk. The low risk, maybe budesonide or azathioprine, the high risk. Uh, you're going to go with biologics. Um, I always go back to this uh, when I have, I'm having trouble convincing a patient about uh, what therapy to go on on biologics, and I think showing them, reminding them about efficacy is always important. And if you show them this, and like this is why we should go with an anti TNF versus azathioprine, and you show them the efficacy results, and that can be very uh, convincing. I'm not saying you have to put everybody on combination therapy. In my own practice with infliximab, I do, at least initially, but uh, this is a, um, a good way to remind patients. And again, showing them the mucosal healing. We're not just treating symptoms, we're actually healing the lining of your bowel. Um, again, the infliximab-based regimens are gonna be better than uh, thiopurines alone. So we have the same issue with um, all the three anti-TNFs approved for Crohn's disease. Um, and some of the study designs are different. Some of them are treat straight through, and some of them uh, are where the uh, responders at induction are re-randomized to drug. And so you have to factor that in when you interpret the results. But in the end, when you compare across the studies, they're all about the same. At the end of the year, you're talking about maybe somewhere between 20 and 30 percent of the patients will be in uh, remission at the end of a year. And, and so from this data, you can't really make any conclusions. Uh, I think, again, we all have this impression in our minds that infliximab is the most effective, but most of our comparative data, either through network meta-analysis or through observational studies like outcomes research, suggest that infliximab and adalimumab are probably fairly similar. Sertralizumab probably is slightly less effective. The other big news with anti-TNFs in Crohn's disease is, you know, over the last several years, we've had accumulating data on the use of biosimilar infliximab. And here, finally, as of last week in The Lancet, uh, we have published a head-to-head -head trial of the CTP13 biosimilar infliximab versus originator infliximab. You can see that the primary endpoint was met. The two drugs were equivalent in terms of clinical response at week six, but you go out and look at all the endpoints, week 14, week 30, look at the different types of response and uh, remission, and you can see that it's basically identical. And so this, to me, is very, very reassuring that uh, the biosimilar is indeed very similar to uh, infliximab. Uh, vetalizumab, the Gemini 2 results, uh, the induction data were mixed, right? I mean, we, the, the uh, one primary endpoint was met, but the second primary endpoint wasn't at week six. However, all the week 52 endpoints were in fact met. And so we have Gemini 2, and then we have Gemini 3. Remember, Gemini 3 was about 400 patients. 300 of the 400 were anti-TNF failures. The other 100 were anti-TNF naive. The primary endpoint was clinical remission 
at week six among the anti-TNF failures. And technically, that endpoint was not met, but it was met in the overall population. And then when you went out to week 10, those endpoints were all met. And so there's this perception that maybe the onset is a little bit slower in Crohn's disease. Uh, we also have ustekinumab uh, available. Ustekinumab is the anti-IL-12, anti-IL-23. And we know that from the uh, Unity 1 trial, this is the, the uh, patients who hadn't failed an anti, or these patients had failed an anti-TNF, excuse me. You can see the results were positive. And then in Unity 2, which were the patients who hadn't failed an anti-TNF, the results were even more positive with a bigger delta compared to placebo. And so the patients who responded in these two trials, the Unity 1 and Unity 2, were then randomized to either placebo or two different doses of ustekinumab. And in the immunity trial, the maintenance data were positive. And uh, this is shown here in this, in, in these, all these endpoints were uh, significant for the last two endpoints, steroid-free remission and sustained clinical remission. Only the 90Q8 dose was positive, the 90Q12 was not. And so the 90Q8 dose is the dose that's um, approved for Crohn's disease. Um, the other um, evolving thing in, in Crohn's disease is this whole concept of treat to target where we assess the patient at baseline. We have an idea of where they're at. We institute our new therapy and then we bring that patient back in approximately six months and we reassess them with the same marker that we used at the beginning. I think of this as, it's like oncology, right? Your oncologist would never prescribe chemotherapy based on your symptoms. Your oncologist would get a PET scan or a CT scan first, then give treatment, and then reassess you after six months. And that's exactly what we're doing here. It's just you need to know if you're making progress. You can't rely on symptoms alone. And so you assess the patient. If they've met the target, then you continue that therapy and then maybe bring them back in a year or two. But if you haven't met the target, you need to make a change in the therapy and then reassess the patient in another six months. And th that's how you, I think it's that process that will uh, change the natural history of Crohn's disease. We have some evidence that this might work. Uh, the COM study, which enrolled 244 patients who were naive to immunomodulators and biologics, and these patients had, um, were either moderate to severe or were steroid dependent. And the conventional arm was treated based on symptoms the, uh, the more aggressively treated arm were based uh, on symptoms, but also based on fecal calprotectin and their CRP. The primary endpoint is the one on the left, and I apologize, something dropped off here in the, in the slides, but you can see that all of the endpoints were statistically significant. I believe one was deep remission and the other one was biochemical remission. And so the patients that were treated more aggressively had higher rates of endoscopic remission at the end of the trial. There were some secondary analyses, such as steroid-free remission, which was higher. Hospitalizations were lower in the more aggressively treated arms. There was a, a interestingly, there were actually fewer serious infections in the patients who were more aggressively treated than the patients who were conventionally managed. And so uh, this suggested that you could affect outcomes in a major way. So for uh, Crohn's disease, we've got multiple uh, biologics. We're limited by, on some of these agents by toxicity. Um, for the patients that have mild disease, we talk about budesonide or prednisone. But for the moderate to severe patients, you probably need to go with um, a biologic. We have good non-anti-TNF options now, including vetalizumab and ustekinumab. Uh, these seem to have a much better safety signal uh, than the other drugs. And then we have other drugs for patients who fail one therapy, we can switch to another. We don't yet have any head-to-head -head trials uh, in Crohn's disease, but there are some in the works and uh, looking forward to those. Uh, for the average bread and butter patient with uh, Crohn's disease, I think an anti-TNF makes the most sense. For patients with fistulizing disease, I would go with either infliximab or adalimumab because we have the most data with those. For the patients with extra intestinal manifestations, 
I would go with an anti-TNF just because of the systemic coverage. However, for patients that are elderly or immunocompromised, I would consider vetalizumab and maybe ustekinumab. And same thing with a patient with a personal history of cancer. I think about vetalizumab or ustekinumab, although probably an anti-TNF is okay. And the patient who is excessively worried about side effects, I would think about uh, vetalizumab or uh, ustekinumab. And so I'm going to stop there and uh, happy to answer any questions during the uh, question and answer uh, uh, session. Thank you.